like the fabled goose that laid the golden egg. Federally funded scientific research has yielded extraordinary yet unexpected returns. Out of odd sounding, obscure beginnings have come many amazing advances that have improved each of our lives. The Golden Goose Award recognizes the people and the stories behind these unexpected and incredible scientific breakthroughs. Dr. Bruce Glick, you know, when I say that name, I get the sort of the uh, goosebumps, you know. Glick had this incredible persona. He's a throwback to the old days, the Renaissance man, driven by curiosity, is willing to share, is willing to mentor, is willing to give. But really it was Bruce Glick's work in discovering the functionality of chickens that contributed to where we are today. It didn't matter what he was doing, he just gave it his 110%. And that was his attitude. He could do anything he put his mind to. That's how he got into the poultry science part of this, because his professor at University of Massachusetts, the guy looked at him like, you're a city guy. You've never even worked on a farm before. And he said, well, I'll work on a farm. And he's like, you can't work on a farm. You don't know anything about it. Well. He proved them wrong. <laughs> I didn't realize until much later on exactly how important his work was. It was a serendipitous discovery that he made that this particular organ called the bursa fibricius, that's located in the rear end of uh, chickens, is the basis of humoral immunity. Humoral immunity is really what we refer to as antibodies. So nobody knew what it was, they just thought, ah, it's an organ that's out there, who cares? Nobody cared for 300 years, until Bruce Glick comes along. You can harken back the early 1950s and him and his colleagues they attempt to send this particular paper describing this foundational discovery to science magazine the editors sent back a note that this was uninteresting and then he goes on to publish it in the journal of poultry science it becomes a citation classic and the poultry science society of america actually designates dr glick's work as the most foundational in poultry science. Not only was his science foundational for uh, knowledge about chickens and, and geese and turkeys, but also for human health and well-being. It is at the basis of what we do today in terms of cancer treatments and the development and deployment of vaccines. It's helping in rheumatology, it's helping in childhood cancers. That sort of a treatment that's happening in the year 2018 would not have been possible without that foundational, seminal work that was done by Bruce Glick and all the others that came along after him. The best way to think about implicit bias is that it's a collection of all the experiences that we have in the world. We have a certain kind of brain. It has learned to detect information in the world as it sees it, store it, and not have to recompute every time. But it turns out our brains are screwed up in that they don't learn accurately. In the late 1980s, we started a line of work which became the work on implicit social cognition. Most of the implicit bias work that we did in it to start was about social groups. How it is that I might perceive people based on gender or age or race or sexual orientation and make judgments about them, not even necessarily intending to. I don't have to ask you how you feel about racial groups or gender groups. 
Instead, I just measure that indirectly. How easily can you associate black faces with good words compared to white faces with good words? The first test I ever took was a race test. I know who I am. I'm the great Mazarin, the egalitarian who's been teaching about all of this stuff. I can associate white and black equally with good and bad. So I do it, white and good, black and bad, easy peasy. I switch and my brain has just slowed down. First of all, I was shocked uh, to discover that I had in me something I wasn't aware of. It put us in a two by two box and didn't let us escape. It said, Mazarin, sit here and confront this. And so the first studies we did were at Yale uh, and at University of Washington on our own students. And then in 1998, we began to worry that maybe people will write this off by saying, oh, college students, who cares? And so I started to make uh, pitches to Mazarin and Tony saying we could put this on the internet. We were expecting that we'd put the test up and maybe 500 people would show up in the first year. And in the first month, we had 45,000 completed tests. And in that moment, I knew the horse has left the barn. We didn't know that we were working on something that could prove practically important. There are many organizations now that want to confront this. Police departments, military, which have been moving to understand these issues in a wonderful way. So much really good work has already been done that it gives us the luxury now of taking a step back and asking one interesting question. And that is, how do we change ourselves? To be a scientist is like being a spy. Only instead of spying on the enemy, you're spying on nature. Nature has secrets and she doesn't want to give them up. What we were interested in was just basic immunology at the time. This was back in the mid 20th century. It was only recently at that time that people actually discovered that the immune system involved more than just making antibodies. The trick is to find that one or two things that don't fit correctly, realize that there's something missing that you don't understand that we don't know yet, and that's what expands our scientific knowledge. Stan was really good at this. This was an amazing thing. He just thought something didn't quite make sense, and he had the wherewithal to pursue it and design experiments to actually come up with this. We found that all these things have in common is that they uh, allow cells to do things to other cells. Uh, and I'll bet you that that's part of not only defense against disease like in the immune system, but it's part of the general physiology of the body. Nothing is real until you name it in cyclonum cytokines, uh, and that's how it began. This was against all the standard theory. No one believed it. Uh, we found it very difficult to get it published. After about two or three years, it caught on uh, as a concept. The cytokines are basically the vocabulary that cells use as part of their language in talking to each other and allows it to interact with other cells. So this is a new way of thinking about how to treat cancer patients. And we can now do that by using all these unique cytokines. People think of scientific discovery as playing a, a telephone pole and you're gonna get something at the top of it. It doesn't work that way. Discovery is like a tree. New things keep popping up along the way, and they create branches, and then you have to explore the branches. And every once in a while, you'll find a branch with a lot of nice fruit, uh, but you don't know in advance which branch it is. It's those new unexpected discoveries that actually lead to big, useful findings. Luckily, the government has gotten very good at understanding this, and there are a number of grants that are given specifically for what is called high gain, high risk. In other words, we don't really know if it's gonna work, but if it does work, you're on the trail of something completely new and original.
Federal funding is important. This research would not have gotten started without it. You need to prove to people that there is something worth pursuing. So that's a little bit of a chicken and an egg, or a goose and an egg. How do you get the preliminary findings without the funding to do the research? And how do you get the funding to do the research without the preliminary findings? We were extremely fortunate to have something called the National Science Foundation. I'd like to believe that there were some visionary people on that committee that said, this looks interesting. Let's give them a little bit of money to see what they can do. And that's the reason we are here today. And so the real value to me of that federal support is really on fundamental science, of looking at questions that are important to investigate just for knowledge sake. You can't plan this out. You stumble into it. The question is, do you have the sense to recognize that you're onto something interesting?